Welcome to the number one podcast covering Michigan State basketball. The Final Four is not in the schedule. Join Rod and me, Eric, as we dive deep into the Spartans to get you prepared for every game. Subscribe today for in-depth recruiting updates and fantastic interviews with today's important college basketball personalities like Robbie Hummel. Thanks for having me. I, uh, I have listened to your guys' podcasts numerous times on drives throughout any Midwestern Big Ten city, so I, I am big fans of your guys' work. Jay Billis. And next time, hey, if anybody in Michigan wants a December tea time, call me. You wimps won't show up, but I'll I'll be there. I'll be there and play in the cold, and Izzo will be in front of the fire with hot chocolate. Coaches Thomas Kelly. Oh, no problem. Glad to be back, man. Glad to be back. Mike Garland. Just can't sit there and trade twos for threes. You can't do it. You're gonna lose. Coming down the stretch, you're gonna lose. And more. You won't find better coverage of Spartan Hoops than you will get here. For both the casual and hardcore fan, come along as we take you for a green and white ride. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. It's Eric alongside Rod here to talk about MSU's 80-72 win over Penn State in Happy Valley. A great road win for Michigan State as they begin to pad their NCAA tournament resume and work towards improve the seating. Well, for what it's worth, <laughs> the game was really not in doubt for the majority of the yeah. game after going on an early 30-11 to 11 run to blow out to a comfortable double-digit lead for the remainder of the game. Big games from Lee Call, who went for 29-10, and 10, and Aikens had a huge first half with 16 points, which helped power the lead for the Spartans and really made the game pretty comfortable. Interestingly, Tyson Walker was held under double-digit scoring, ending his run of 35 games, which stretched back to the last season of scoring double digits or more. Uh, other stats of note is Michigan State dominated the boards, scored off Penn State turnovers, which often led to uh, transition buckets. And also, if there's one more thing I can add to the summary of the game, how nice was it to have a game with so much free flow and a relative lack of whistles? It was really, I thought, great. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. It got got a little dicey there at the end, but yeah, totally agreed. You know, it was a, it's a weird game because, as you said, Michigan State was really... I would say firmly in control for what the last uh, Last eight minutes of the first half. I was going to say 27, 28 minutes of the game. Yeah. It ended up an eight point win. That's the closest they got in the second half. They, there was one other occasion where I think earlier in the half where they got it to eight. So Michigan state did a really good job. I felt in the second half. I know Izzo, Sounded a little bit disappointed that that the second half wasn't as good as the first. But when you're up 14 at the half, it's tough to build on that. (laughs) And I thought Michigan State actually did a pretty good job of every time Penn State would make a little run, get it to 10, MSU would give them the Heisman. And a lot of that was Malik (laughs) Call, who was fantastic. This this is probably, I mean, you take everything into account. Might be the best game he's ever played at Michigan State. I mean, it's career high in scoring easily. He had 29 points. I think his previous high was 24, which he he scored against them in the first matchup. But, <laughs> right. But then he also had 10 rebounds. So to have a double-double on a day where you set your career scoring high, that's pretty impressive stuff. Um, and Penn State just had no answer for him you know, physically. He he yeah. was just destroying people, but it was more than that. His footwork, his ball handling, he hit the only, I believe, the only three he took. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Just really, really great stuff. Obviously, really good work on the boards. Just a, a great game from him. But I say it's a weird game because, you know, you look at some of the things Penn State did. They were 12 for 23 from three. Now, that got boosted a little bit by two garbage time threes in the last 40 seconds, but they still mm-hmm. would have been in the high 40s, Yeah, even without 50, those. Yeah, right. And, you know, it's it was, it was strange that a day where they shot that well at home and it really didn't matter. Michigan State was able to do everything else. Um, finally, they put a game up where they controlled the boards against a bad rebounding opponent, which is, you yeah. know, exactly what you <laughs> want to see, right? Um, right. So MSU, an 11-6 to six edge in offensive rebounds. Um, I didn't look at the, the rebounding percentages, but I got to believe. I got them for you. Yeah. Do you? It, it, they, was 20% to, it was 20.6 to 38%. That's domination. I mean, it's almost yeah. doubling now, which is yeah. 
reflective of the the numbers, 11 to 6, almost doubled up. That was huge. Um, so to see that happen and for them to do exactly what they're supposed to do against a team that doesn't rebound well, as we've been talking about all year, that's been the problem. It's not the good rebounding opponents. It's the teams that don't <laughs> board well. Well, that yeah. changed today. Um, turnovers. MSU at 11. They got a little sloppy late. Yeah. Um, but late, Penn yeah. State had 15. Um, MSU, though, doubled them up, and we always talk about this as important, doubled them up 6-3 to three in steals. So those live ball turnovers were, were important, and Michigan State had um, – now, I'm not finding points off turnovers. They're, I'm not finding points off turnovers. They had 20 points reasons. off turnovers, yeah. And, that, I mean, the, yeah. just like that example is that one there that Jaden had that he came out of nowhere and just went all, coast to coast just dunked yeah. right off. <laughs> that was impressive. 20, 20 to 11 margin. Yeah. That's that's really, really significant. Um, you know, and the, uh, the rebounding, just to turn back to that, second chance points, MSU almost doubled them up as well, 15 to 8. So you put those two categories together, you're getting much more done in second chance points. You're getting much more done um, off turnovers. You're going to be very, very difficult to beat. And Michigan State was difficult to beat. So it was pretty, pretty remarkable um, performance on the road, given how Big Ten teams have fared. You know, no matter yeah, who you're right. playing, it, especially yeah. And look, we've talked about it. Penn State came into this game having won three or four. They were six and seven in the league. So this is not the Penn State team that we thought we were going to see at the start of the year, or even when that first game in early January at the Breast took place. This is right. a this is a different team, a team that's definitely got some confidence rolling. And yet, Michigan State made. I mean, an eight point margin doesn't look like a decisive win, but but this was a decisive win. It really it was, was 14 with like 50 with 40, seconds left, 40 seconds left. It was. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. Yeah. So th this was a decisive win. And to do that on the road against a team that had been playing very well. Hey, that's, you know, you, you can't take that for granted in 2024. Like that's <laughs> that's big time stuff. And, and also on a day where, frankly, they didn't get a great game out of A.J., they didn't get much scoring out of Tyson. Now I thought Tyson was really good defensively, and he had six yeah. re he had six rebounds, <laughs> which is I huge. It, you want to talk about why Michigan State handled their business on the glass? Start with guard rebounding. To have a yep. guy step up and get six, big deal. So, you know, it broke Tyson's streak as you mentioned. But hey, if if that's going to happen. You'll take it if he does all the other things that he did today. You bet you Jade Naked's first half was insane shooting the ball. Second half, he only scored four points, but it still adds up to another 20-point game. And how about Carson Cooper? I, I think yeah. quietly, quietly, Carson Cooper has been playing some pretty damned good basketball. You know, he gets into double digits, which I believe is the first time this year, maybe the first time in his that, career. I think that's his career high, yeah. Yeah. Ten points. And not a dominant performance on the boards, but he had four, and he had a block. So, you know, and two offensive rebounds. And there were some. There were definitely in the first half, there was one where he just laid out to deflect the ball, and I'm not sure that yes. he even got credit for the offensive rebound. But he's the guy that made that probably did but he's the guy who made the play. I just thought he did a lot of good things in that regard. He was running the floor well. So really good stuff from him. Uh, Xavier Booker only played a few minutes, but he, he made him count, and there's been a lot of consternation, obviously all year <laughs> long, but especially recently over why doesn't he play more. Well, there 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 are some good reasons for that, but – you have to say, you have a game like this one, which, let's be honest, the physical challenges that Penn State presents for a guy like him, the challenges, period, are very different than, say, Illinois presented. Yeah, I didn't think right. there was much of an opportunity to play him against Illinois. I really didn't. Tonight there was, and he got his chance. And, I mean, I was more impressed by the, the quick turn and finish around the rim yeah, than the three because really we've seen him hit the three, 
but that was that was nice to see from him. Um, Cohen Carr got a transition dunk that was good. Um, struggled some when he played in the second half, uh, and and you know the, the, if if we're going to say that Cohen's maybe not ready to face full court pressure entirely, I think that's fair. But I think so. Um, you know, overall, a lot of good basketball from a lot of people, and yet you didn't get the dominant performances that I think most people think MSU needs usually to win from Tyson and from AJ, and yet MSU kind of coasted. The, the other guy yeah. I wanted to mention, too, while we're talking about individuals, is is Trey Holloman. And I, mm-hmm. I do feel, you know, Trey's numbers were not terrible tonight. He had He only had one point. He had three rebounds, one offensive. He had four assists, but he did have two turnovers, and it's it's a sign of some good things that I'm complaining about merely a two to one ratio for him. <laughs> but yeah. I do think that Trey's been kind of fighting it over the last three or four games. Mm-hmm. I don't think he's looked in time. And, and today it was, to me, it was noticeable when Penn State would try to turn up the heat with ball pressure. I did not think he looked as comfortable as we're used to seeing him look, even when opponents have pressured him. I didn't think he was as good. And so I I don't think it's a big deal. I think he's just kind of fighting through something. And and that happens with young players, but he is fighting through something. You know, I think you have to acknowledge it. Um, I I would just say, though, in the response that I – I thought the first half where he, I thought his first half turn was really good. And I think that he, when he came in and Hogarth hit the bench, that's when they went on that big run, you know, and I think he was partly responsible at, for his defense. And then he did also defend for, well. I, he did defend well. Yeah. I think he just, yeah. If, if, um, I'm just saying offensively, he just, he hasn't looked quite as comfortable to me of late. And that's yeah. not, no, just, I agree. It's I not agree. just tonight. It's been, like I say, maybe the last three games, maybe the last four. Um, yep. He just hasn't looked the way he has for most of the season. And again, I I don't I don't say that other than to note that hey, this is something that young players, and he is still a young player, go through, and um, you know they need him to get through it. But I'd rather see him going through it now than say three weeks from now. Uh, he's got plenty yeah. of time, plenty of opportunities to play his way past it and and find a rhythm again offensively. Um, one other thing that I thought was noteworthy, and we saw we saw some of it in both halves that and I liked for the first time in a long time, we saw Michigan State applying full court ball pressure. Yep. And I thought it worked really well. And and I'm I'm interested, you know, it's interesting that they did it because on paper, this is not a team you would think you'd unveil that against. Why do I say that? Because Penn State is a guard-heavy team in terms of where their scoring comes from. They are also a team that, despite playing fast, usually does a pretty good job holding down turnovers. They haven't done that against Michigan State in either game, but that's their their normal MO. They're, I think they came in number 62 in the nation in yep. turnover percentage. That's a very good yes. number. So um, it was interesting that MSU did it. I thought it was effective. And it helped keep the game fast. You know, Penn State likes to play fast, too. They want to play a loose kind of full court game. You mentioned how it was nice that the fouls didn't get called excessively and bog this one down, and we were able to see a game develop a rhythm. And I think both teams probably like that. But honestly, for as much as Penn State wants to play that way, if if you're going to go in a full court game against – there's only one team in this conference that I think has a chance – in that kind of game, and that would be Iowa. They're the only yeah, team that I scores more. Iowa. But the problem yeah. is Iowa is so bad defensively that even they probably would get beat playing that way because yes. MSU is going to score more against them than the other way around. But I, so I don't think that was a winning formula for Penn State, unfortunately, <laughs> unless unless MSU was just making a ton of mistakes, which they they just didn't. So yeah, I thought that's what that was one of the things that really. Uh, killed Penn State especially in the first half they just had untimely turnovers yeah uh, especially during that run they'd have something that kind of look like they get a stop and then they turn it over you know or, and yep. then Michigan State would come down to score again and so they just uh, they just were just flawed enough either defensively and they're missing assignments leaving Jaden wide open I mean how many yeah. times did they leave him wide open in the corner yeah. <laughs> it's just like yeah. crazy 
And then, uh, so it, Michigan State was great at exploiting that. They did, and their their offense, it wasn't quite as easy as the Maryland away game, but it felt like that a little bit in the first half where they were just kind of getting whatever they wanted for that yeah. stretch where they just really pushed out that lead. Absolutely. And and I thought that was, um, you know, and it came in a variety of ways too. That's encouraging. Like you obviously, you had that, you had that period where Jaden just exploded. And then you had Malik doing damage in the first half. It was pretty much all down low. Uh, yep. And he was he was doing that. Um, you know, and, that, and the Carson, I think Carson had eight of his points in the first half. So he was able to do some damage uh, again yeah. around the rim. So they were doing it both from and and book hit his three in the first half. So it was both inside and out. It was very balanced. Didn't make a ton of mistakes with turnovers, uh, and and just executed. The other thing that was nice too, while we're complimenting what Michigan State did, is the free throw line performance. Not that it was a huge deal for either team, because as you said, there weren't a ton of fouls called, but MSU was fourteen for sixteen, led by Malik calls eight for eight, Carson four for four, which was really nice yeah. to see, and then. Trey Holloman and, and Marty Sissoko each one for two. Uh, so Malik did did the bulk of the work there, but that's good to see after, you know, we go back to that Minnesota game where for Malik individually, the the problem. <laughs> yeah, and and the team as a whole just shot so poorly to, to see a second straight game because they shot it pretty well against Illinois, well enough to win, obviously. Um, and to see them do it again, that's that's important. Because it's it's all those little things that are going to matter in these games, especially on the road in this league. You know what you're facing. The margins tend to be tight. They tend to be small, and so you gotta you gotta get it done in those areas. And it's it's nice to see them responding over the last couple games from the line. Because as we've talked about, that's that's an area that's been a problem all year long. Really, they haven't shot it well. But that Minnesota game is the first time I think it was one of the top items you'd look at to say, well, that was responsible for the loss. Yeah. It was the way we shot it. They didn't they didn't put themselves in that position tonight, that's for sure. Yeah, I was most surprised at Malik Hall, because you know, it it was probably maybe about ten minutes into that second half that I that I think really started realizing that what he was doing because he was very quiet scoring, you know, for the most part. He was it wasn't like a I don't know. It wasn't real loud. Like Aikens, you knew. I mean, he scored all the big flurry of those threes in a row with that big dunk. I mean, you knew he was on the court. Yeah. Malik was just kind of like workmanlike, just going, just getting stuff done. And even in the second half, and then you started realizing, oh, he's just exploding these guys and well, just tearing late, them apart. Late in the second half, the last 10 minutes of the game, yeah. that's when then he, he just really like, took over. I agree with you up until then. And that's actually something I really liked about the way he played. Is yes. that it was just, it was just a steady steady contribution he was never you know going through a big spurt where he just took things over but at the same time um he was contributing steadily Mm -hmm. and then when winning time arrived you know all right we gotta we gotta put this one away well he showed up and and penn state had no answer for him you know obviously there are teams that are capable of doing a better job against him defensively than Penn State, because Penn State just doesn't have good physical matchups. Lafonso no. Ellis kept talking about how uh, Kern, in particular, is just giving up way too much in in terms of bulk and strength. But you know, we're going to see a better matchup, for example, from Malik physically on Saturday night uh, when he has mm-hmm. to go up against uh, Camwa. You know, that's a guy who's actually a little bigger than Malik, so. But, you know, Illinois has guys who on paper were better matchups physically, and they didn't do much with him either. Right now, you know, Malik Call, we, we've gone from this, wow, is he still going to be the same one game on, one game off guy that he's been? We've gone from that to now, if he closes the year, the way that he's been playing really since Big Ten play kicked back in. I mean, you had the one bad game against Northwestern. Minnesota, he wasn't great, but it wasn't a zero. Other than that, if he keeps, if he finishes at this level, and I don't mean, you know, 29 and 10, I just mean 
<laughs> double digit yeah. scoring and rebounding the way he is, you're probably talking about some level of all Big Ten recognition when it's all said and done. I'm not saying yeah. first team, it won't be first team, but second team, third team, yeah. He's gonna he's gonna land on one of those one of those two teams because he just he completely changes the complexion of things. And you look at it now for Michigan State. What does this Malik call do? Well, you start, it gives you a post presence that for a lot of this year and really all of last year, they don't have otherwise. That's a huge deal to have a guy like that playing the way he is in that phase of the game. It just changes the dynamic. It it gives you that additional option, that additional threat that teams have got to deal with. You know, and then you add in the fact that Malik's not just a post scorer. He can do other things. It's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, defensively, he's been very good too. I Abs- mean, that's the other. Absolutely. Right? I mean, Absolutely. And, you know, if, if things continue the way they've been going with, let's say, Madi's role being reduced a bit, Malik may, I haven't looked at the season averages, but Malik may end up leading the team in rebounding. It wouldn't shock me if we got there. Yeah. Yeah, the only other thing I would add is the this is a game that was like a tr- little tricky. I mean, obviously Penn State's been playing well, and it's on the road, obviously, so that makes it tough. But this is a game you came off the big win against Illinois. You've got the game against your rival in the next. This is actually one of those. It's it could be an easy trap game to get sort of lost and uh, and to not come out with the right energy. So it's very impressive that they they showed up and played so well. Really, from yeah, you know, after they got after they got going rolling after a few minutes into the game. Uh, so it's good to see that from the from the game. You'd expect that with a bunch of seniors, but we've expected a lot of things, and they, we haven't hey, seen much of the season. Right. I, I was going to say we haven't seen that consistently, right? So yeah. that no, all of that is very valid. You come off a huge emotional win, and and you've got everybody. You know they they've got people around them. Certainly Talk about yeah, patting them on the back. You guys have you know Izzo talked about it this week. Say you know. You can't you can't play as if well you're at Michigan State therefore you're entitled to an NCAA tournament bid that just comes with the jersey it doesn't yeah. work that way and so that is a real thing that's a real thing for this team and to see them respond this way and you know they're gonna have another challenge I mean the challenges just keep keep coming and they're gonna have another yeah, challenge but Saturday yeah. mm-hmm. but this was great to see because. What you what you sensed was this was a team capable of and focused on just taking care of business, just going out, playing the way that they're capable of, and doing the things they need to do to get a win in you know in a, in a an environment that's not easy, which any Big Ten road venue qualifies as at this point. Is it fair to say that Final Four is not on the schedule, Rod? Yeah, right. Well, and that's, <laughs> that's the thing, but I think what Izzo was saying, and, and yeah, he's the, the right, team, yeah. is we we do assume the NCAA tournament's on the schedule, right? Right, yeah, right. And his point is, well, no, that's not given to you either. And of course he's right about that. It's, you know, we've been we're really fortunate because people go on about the street, but, but the other part of that that's, that gets forgotten sometimes is it's not just the street. It's the fact that there has not been a single selection Sunday in the last quarter century. Let that sink in that <laughs> Michigan state fans have gone. It turned on that CBS at six at six o'clock on Sunday night and been worried. Hasn't happened, you know, so it's not even just the streak. It's that they haven't really had a close call. Now, you know, we all know the COVID year was their backs were against the wall for, <laughs> you know, about three weeks where they pretty much had to win all of these high-level games, and they did. But I'm just saying by the time they got there, they have not truly been a bubble team. That year was the closest because they ended up in the play-in game, but that was surprising. Nobody saw that coming going into Selection Sunday. I think the general consensus was – They'd done enough to move out of date. Yeah. And it turned right. out they hadn't. But but still, you weren't nervous about, well, mm-hmm. is MSU yeah. going to show up? So when you have that as a background, it's easy to sort of understand why 
I, let's put it this way. I have slightly more sympathy for that feeling among fans than I do for the, well, if we don't get to a final four, it's a failure kind of bit, <laughs> you know, which our <laughs> podcast is basically referencing. In yeah. Its right. title. I, I do get it. It's, it's still wrong because I can, I can reel off without having to work very hard within the last five years, the gigantic historic programs that have missed the NCAA tournament. Indiana, Kentucky, North Carolina, Duke, all of them within the last five years have missed a tournament. Yeah. So it's not a gift, but, you know, they, look, this team, it, it, a, a, an effort like tonight is exactly what you want to see in terms of demonstrating that there's a, a hopefully an increasing maturity um seniors playing like you'd expect as you said you know all mm-hmm. those types of things that you, you really do need to see happen you know another mature thing to do is to make sure that your your gutters are taken care of in your house <laughs> <laughs> make sure make sure you have uh water can be a real problem in the state of michigan so you want to make sure you have good gutter work good downspouts make sure that water flows a long ways away from your foundation not only your house, but also your business. You don't want that water getting inside, getting in the basement. It can cause all kinds of trouble, especially if the snow melts. Oh, we don't have any snow right now, but there's, you know, it's still early. It's only mid-February. We're probably due for a couple snowfalls with some melting snow. And so you want to make sure that all that system works properly. The Brothers Just You Gutters are the go-to service to take care of that. They only do gutters. They specialize it. They are fantastic. They do a great job. You get 10% off your estimate if you contact them, if you're in the either the Metro Detroit area or the Metro Grand Rapids area. So both teams will take care of you. You can find contact information at the final four is not the schedule.com slash support there. You can get an estimate uh, to get some work done. And again, they'll take care of whatever needs to be done, whether it's a big job or a little job, they will take care of you. Uh, so they sponsor the player that Michigan state needs to keep in the gutter. And that player, I was smart this time. I actually circled. It was Kanye Clary. And I'd say pretty definitively, Michigan state kept him in the gutter. He didn't end up playing a ton. He well, I guess twenty three minutes, so pretty yeah. good. He actually played more than we thought he more than he'd been playing recently. Uh, he scored eight points, three of six from the field, uh, zero for one from three. Had a couple free throws, uh, two rebounds, five assists, three turnovers, and a couple steals. So he actually played pretty well for them. But I mean, he didn't really impact the game significantly. I don't think. I think they did a good job with him. They they did, and and here's the thing. Now uh, I, I'll buy that. Some of it may be, we'll call it self-limitation, um, as he's trying to, you know, the, the way they put it, I think it was, or I think it might have been Raphael Davis on the um, the BTN studio show, or, or, or maybe it was Bruce Weber. Somebody mentioned that, you know, Penn State will get better to close this season as, as Clary and uh, Baldwin readjust to playing beside one another Mm -hmm. and there may be some truth to that i mean we talked about how during his absence you know baldwin has really taken off it actually started before that but it it pretty clearly looks like baldwin's team right now when you watch them play like it did tonight uh which it wasn't earlier in the year but all that said i i think it was hard to imagine penn state finding a way to win this one if Clary didn't have a bigger impact than he had. You know, you're, you're right to note, like, the efficiency stuff is not terrible. He was 50% from the floor. He hit his two free throws. MSU only let him attempt one three, and he missed that. So that's a big deal because he's yep. one of their better shooters. Uh, so that was important. Five assists, three turnovers. That's okay. He's not their primary playmaker anyway. Uh, but they didn't let him really get going in in any sustained way where he was able to impact the game, you know. And and frankly, Kern and Hicks have both having games outside the norm for them yeah. is what kept them even as close as they were. You know, the first mm-hmm. game, if you remember, it was mostly. It was Clary and kind of nobody else. Yeah, it's pretty much Clary at the line. <laughs> yeah. The, the difference between that game and this game is Kern and Hicks. Yeah. You know, that's 14 from Kern, 15 from Hicks. 
And, uh, you know, Baldwin at 15 as well, though he wasn't nearly as efficient as the other two guys. So, um, yeah, if they were, if they were going to win though, I think they had to get more, uh, more production out of Clary than they did. And so you, you got to give Michigan state some credit for that. Yeah. Well, I mean, impressive Kern and Hicks combined went seven of eight from three. I mean, they're, yeah, you know, like you ridic- said, they're the ones that's who kept them. ridiculous. And I understand that. Hicks in particular has been shooting the three better of late, but that was, <laughs> that's the thing. Well, I said, well, a that's a home game. That's a home court thing. You got to overcome, it right? Is, I mean, it is, on the road. it is absolutely. And, and, you know, we talk about how Penn, we'll, we'll return to this, the keys, but Penn state is a team that really does, even though they're not a great three point shooting team, they do rely on it a lot and they have to, because they just don't, mm-hmm. You, you look at this game tonight, you say, well, 12 for 23 from three is fantastic. You know what they shot inside the arc? 40%. That's And some of that is that Michigan State is a really good defensive team against twos. But some yeah. of it is that Penn State just doesn't have much that they can get going inside the arc. So, yeah. It, it's, and the biggest but, thing with them going inside is they were getting, they're turning the ball over a ton too. Yep. I mean, Kern had two threes, but he also had five turnovers. I mean, exactly. They really struggled. Exactly. They, they have to try to do a lot in those situations and they just don't have guys that are going to be capable of making a lot of those plays. All right. So then we'll talk about our squeegee squad of Grand Rapids. If you need your windows cleaned, no better place to go. The squeegee squad of Grand Rapids, if you're on the West side of the state. They will obviously clean your windows, but they'll clean the inside, not just the outside. They can power wash your house. Whatever you need done, it is uh, definitely that season where things are getting kind of mucky and dirty. So if you want to put a new shine on the side of your house, contact the Squeegee Squad of Grand Rapids. Uh, They will do a fantastic job. They're professionals. They have great pricing, and they come out quickly and take care of things. Uh, They're very meticulous in what they do. Um, And so they sponsor the uh, player that Michigan State cleans glass the best, which obviously this game was Malik Hall. And so I was down five to three and a half. And so you picked Mighty Sissoko who had, <laughs> and finished with one. <laughs> so uh, yeah. I, well, the, I won the this, second game in a row, right? Yeah, I was going to say, I win this running away. And number two was Tyson Walker, as you mentioned. Uh, yep. Kind of surprising there. Yeah. Uh, so I think, you know, so now it's five to four and a half. And again, I was just saying, I don't think, I don't think I'd won since like the Reagan administration. So it's nice <laughs> to get one back. So I'm only half game back now. But... Uh, you wonder too if we're getting to the point where now the last time that Mahdi didn't start, Carson had a bad game, if I recall. It was early in the season when Carson yeah. started over Mahdi. And that sort of woke Mahdi up and he I feel like we're gonna have maybe Mahdi start, but he's gonna his minutes are gonna really start diminishing to like maybe around well, ten or eleven. You I know, think Kohler's gonna start playing a little bit more. I mean, what do you think about that? And Cooper looks like he's starting to finally progress what we had expected. I think they have. Or the last two games we've seen it, you know. Look, Izzo's yeah. going to be... They're about be, the same here, 18-17. Well, pretty much the really? Same God, he played eight. Mati played 18 It felt like Carson minutes. Cooper's out there. Yeah, I mean, Carson wow. would play one more minute. I would not have guessed he played 18. Yeah, um, it was more impactful, right? I mean, you definitely yeah. saw that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of our competition, what the last couple of weeks has shown is that we can no longer default to, well, whoever's got first pick is likely going to win. We're in a, <laughs> right. but now Malik is really coming off. But as we've seen, you've got some guards finally chipping in. Yeah. You got Carson Cooper played enough minutes where, you know, he only had four in this game, but I think in the right circumstances, you could see him lead the team in rebounding at some point yep. in a game. Um, Yeah. I think that, I think that right now Izzo is doing what he ought to do, which is, to an extent, I mean, they script it to some to some degree, but I think as the game progresses, he's going with a feel with whomever the hot hand is, and that doesn't mean what he usually usually that means whoever's scoring, right? It yeah, doesn't necessarily just, mean that, yeah, but it means whoever is playing the best on a given day. And Carson has been coming on, uh, Jackson. I I didn't think was as good in this one as he was against Illinois, I was a little bit disappointed. Um, He missed one decent move on a fadeaway jumper in the lane. And then, Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm trying to 
think what else. I, he, he missed, missed another, another one. I shot. think it went blocked or like it was yeah. like a kind of under the basket or something. He did have like two rebounds. He did have two rebounds and a block, but um, only played six minutes. But you know, I I think it's still a situation where we're going to see some better things out of him. And then let's note, I, I I'm willing to to be corrected on this, but I believe when Book was in the game in the first half, was he not playing the five as well? Because uh, I know, see, I know Malik, he was out there with Kohler. I thought he was out and there. With I think he was Malik. out there with Kohler and Carr. Wasn't he out there with no, Kohler and Carr? No, I don't think so. I think okay. he was out there with Malik. Okay. That's how I remember it at least, but I could be wrong. As I said, I'll, I'm willing to stand corrected, but I guess the point is, it's. I think that we're seeing what this is going to be the rest of the way, unless, unless Carson just actually continues to progress even from here, and we start seeing him reaching a level of play as a rebounder and chipping it with some scoring, and that the defense stays steady. That might tilt it a little bit more in his direction. He's the one guy out of the group that right now. I feel like would have a chance to maybe edge up over that 20 minutes a game mark. Um, Mm -hmm. But I'm not predicting it just yet. I think we are going to see it continue to be divvied up um, the way that we have been seeing lately. Yeah. I think it's a meet by committee. I think you're totally right. All right. Well, let's uh, let's then move on to our uh, five keys of the game brought to you by nudge printing, nudge printing. If you want, well, if you're, if you ordered your, Spartan apparel for the final fours on the schedule. The logo stuff should be mine's at least being shipped in the mail. So I think everyone should be getting their stuff pretty soon. I'll be wearing mine at the Michigan game. I'm actually going to head to the Chrysler center on Saturday night, uh, head on over to Ann Arbor and, uh, and catch some action in the, I don't know. We're not going to call it the catacomb like Bryce Jordan, but I don't know what we'll call the Chrysler center. Um, well, a uh, years ago before they did a remodeling. So this is in, I think this was in the Amaker era. I believe it was post Ellerby. There was what to me was a very famous photo. It got it definitely got some time. One of the newspapers, the free press or the news, of a bird perched on a beam in the upper reaches of Chrysler. Now, in fairness, that can happen in a lot of buildings. Yeah, I've seen it at the Breslin too, yeah. But, but we're not gonna not count nest, we're not gonna count that because <laughs> this one <laughs> was it, it happened to correspond with not that many humans in the building so i took to referring <laughs> to it to chrysler as the aviary which if you don't know is a technical term for a bird sanctuary a, a home for birds and and usually that means it's a place that's kind of wide open and not cluttered up by too many people so that's my that's always been my go-to for chrysler but it certainly has this year. I mean, you've seen those pictures before, like even yeah. before that Wisconsin tip. I mean, there was, there were dozens on hand. It was pretty surprising. And it, it, now, I don't think it's going to be quiet on Saturday, but that's going to have nothing to do with Michigan's fans. I yeah, I think there'll be quite a few Michigan State There's fans. There's going to be a lot. Yeah, for sure. And I, I have yeah. been in that building. If if you've been in that building in some of those years, I went, I want to say back to back, in 99 and 2000, definitely 2000, uh, but I believe 99 as well. I was at, at Chrysler for both of those games, and it was, I mean, I don't know what the final numbers were, but it felt like no worse than 50-50. Sure. I mean, yeah. Michigan State fans just dominated the building. Yeah, that's embarrassing in your home yeah. court. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I'll be there with my nudge printing stuff. You can get your apparel. Great Spartan Apparel and other schools in the state of Michigan outside of the University of Michigan, also University of Indiana. So anyway, you can get all that stuff at nudgeprinting.com. Super comfortable, easy to, uh, very breathable, very wearable. Uh, last through a million washes. It's just the best stuff. My family, it's our favorite. So you can't go wrong. 20% off. You mentioned Final Four. Type that in at the coupon code at checkout. Again, that's nudgeprinting at nudgeprinting.com. Links to that can be found at our support page at tiffnots.com slash support. So the first key of the game was the glass. And we already mentioned Michigan State dominated here. Overall numbers, 33 to 23. Uh, offensive rebounding, Penn State only 20.6%. Michigan State a 38% uh, average. And so yeah. both teams shot the ball 
pretty well. Michigan State even better. So it just made it be just by the numbers. It shows why why the, the score was so lopsided. Yeah, and and a a near doubling. I believe it was. I can't remember what the final. I think it was yeah, 15, eleven to six. 15, I think no, it was but it was 15, eleven to six. Oh, you talking about rebounds? Fifteen yeah. to eight in second chance yeah. points. So right. near doubling in both those categories. Just any way you slice it, a a dominant rebounding performance at both ends by Michigan State. We said in the pregame, the big one was MSU's defensive boards. If they're not right. getting a ton of second chances, that's fine. But you can't give them up to Penn State. And just think about what this game, you know, this game might have been competitive if Michigan State hadn't done that kind of job. Penn State was, you know, most of that second half was obviously almost all of it was played in double digits. But if you give Penn State, you know, six or seven more offensive rebounds, they're able to yeah. turn that into, you know, six, eight points. You know, you got a, you got a tighter game at that stage. Yeah. So it was really important. And then just to to add on to that, the fact that MSU also was so good on its offensive end, it just made it even better. Well, those are all things we know they can do. <laughs> they just haven't been we've doing seen it, it consistently. We, we've seen it, and again, the, the the progress represented here. You know, you might you might look at it and think, well, Penn State is not a good rebounding team at either end anyway. So, isn't that what you're supposed to do? But that's where MSU's had its problems in those games. Right. Not for the most part, not the games where they're playing somebody who actually does rebound. well. So the second key to the game was chaos. Uh, Penn State obviously likes to try and do some pressure. They like to get some steals. Michigan State ended up doubling up in steals with a 6-3 edge there. They won the turnover battle 15-11. to 11. Uh, They scored 20-11 to 11 on points off turnovers of Penn State. I mean, especially in the first half, it was the chaos was went the wrong way against the Nittany Lions. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, I thought Michigan State, for the most part, just a couple of brief exceptions, but in a, you know, in a 66 possession game, you're going to have some of those. Uh, not a big deal. I thought for the most part, MSU handled it really well. They just, uh, Penn State was, Penn State was never able to get what, what I think they really look for, which is not just the odd turnover, but, the effect of sustained pressure where maybe you get, you know, you generate three turnovers and four possessions, something like that. Right. Which gives yeah. you an opportunity to get some easy baskets, get some momentum built, all of those things that never happened in this one. Yeah. They're listed as having five fast break points to Michigan State's 12. I, I don't remember those, yeah. those uh, fast break points off turnovers. Maybe they, I just don't recall them. I mean, I remember Michigan State had a lot of really emphatic ones, especially Jaden had two, Big ones, you know, that first half. So anyway, Michigan State definitely dominated that part for sure. Yeah. Uh, so third key to the game was offensive balance, and that's looking for not only transition, but the ability to score inside. And Michigan State, yeah. thanks to Malik Hall largely, I mean, he got a lot at the line done, but he also got a lot in the lane. I mean, what was the uh, bet the points in the paint uh, was? Uh, points in the paint was decisively 40 to 22, Michigan yeah, State. Yeah, there you go. Yep. 40 points in the paint. Out of seven, out of eighty total, half your points, that's productive. And you know, look, MSU from three got off to a hot start. They weren't very good in the second half. They still ended up uh, six for six for fifteen, which is yeah forty um, forty yeah. percent, which is totally you know that's totally acceptable. Yeah, no better problems with that. <laughs> yeah, way better than average. Um, but it was it was significant. To see that we said, we said in the preview of this game, Penn State. If you remember, we talked about the game plan, right? And we looked back yep. at that Illinois game and said, "Well, the game plan there for Michigan State was take the ball inside, and MSU didn't shoot many threes, which was part of you know it was give Illinois credit for that too, but it was also part of the game plan." for MSU to attack them. That's where they felt they were more vulnerable, and they were. This game, Penn State's not as good at limiting threes as Illinois is, but they are very vulnerable inside the arc. Yeah, And so it seemed like it would shape up as a similar game, try to attack these guys. It didn't unfold in exactly the same way, but the end result was similar. In the Illinois game, MSU did it 
via a lot of guard penetration. Well, we didn't see that as much in this one. You know, AJ did not have a big scoring game. Tyson did not have a big scoring game. Jaden did, but the vast majority of that came on jumpers, almost all of it. Other other than the transition dunk, I think all of it came on jumpers. Um, Trey only scored one point, so they weren't doing it that way. They were doing it with Malik Hall, certainly, but also some contributions here and there from other guys like Carson Cooper scoring around the rim, getting into the paint and converting. And so that was, and also what doesn't show up in those points in the paint stats, but really should, if, and if you watch the game, you know this, Malik Hall himself got eight free throws in yeah. this game and made them all. So MSU was also forcing Penn State to foul in those areas of the court and then stepping up and converting. And Carson Cooper, four for four. So they had, tw- all, they had 12 free throws, 12 of their 14 makes came really in uh, paint situations where a guy was fouled around the arc. Actually, check that. Three of Malik's did not because he got fouled on attempting a three. But other than that, nine of those 12 between those two guys came in the paint. So it's an even better performance than the just the pure points in the paint number would tell you. So the fourth key to the game was contesting the three. Well, this is something that Michigan State did not do well. Uh, Penn State, 12 of 23. Now, I think you could say, well, they shot well above their average, and that's true, but they had a lot of wide open looks, and there's, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'd say that that was poorly, poorly executed defense, and I'm sure that's what Izzo will talk about, how they just allowed them to get too many off that were real clean looks. It's not, it's, it's not ideal. There's no doubt about that. I would say if you had Hicks and Kern going off the way they did, God bless you. You should take your act to Vegas because <laughs> nobody saw that coming. I don't care how hot Hicks has been lately. Nobody saw that coming. Wide open or not, you know, those are guys that, you know, we talk about this a lot that, and coaches don't like to admit this, but it's the truth. You can't take away everything yeah. defensively. So you're going to give up something. When you're facing this team, no, notice something. Notice Clary only had one attempt from mm-hmm. three. You know, what was, um? I guess I got to look at it here. Baldwin was one of four. There you go. Okay. So he only gets up four and he only hits, he only hits one of them. Dunn is one of their better shooters. He was one for three. Um, Brown one for four. It's just Brown those two guys, Hicks four. and Kern. And then and Puff Johnson obviously chipped in with a couple. But but again, I would say with him, sub 25% shooter from three on the year. Are you going to be okay <laughs> with them? You don't want anybody to be wide open. But it seems to me that when Michigan State made those mistakes or or at least didn't execute as well as they would like to have, the right guys were ending up with the ball. It's just they hit them. So, yeah. all right. Uh, you know, the the attempts, I believe Penn State averages 24 a game. So this would be one below that. So, you know, they didn't, they didn't let them go really crazy in terms of throwing up threes. But, um, yeah, you can't give MSU a check mark on a day where somebody goes 12 and 23. That's, that's just not going to happen. But some of it I'm going to attribute to you know, they kind of the tip your hat. Well, okay. Guy who shouldn't be making them makes them. All right. You got to live with it. But it doesn't mean you were wrong strategically. Yeah. Right. It just means that they, they beat the strategy. You know, sometimes that happens. Unlike in football, it's really hard to get a shutout in basketball. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, in final, fifth and final key to the game was the transition. Penn State likes to play fast. Michigan State does too. Big win here for Michigan State. Yeah, and those game, this, is the game, first half. this is the game where those fast break numbers are garbage. And I'll, I'll guarantee you some of it. Like, there was a play where, I think it came in the first half, where they got the ball down, Carson sprinted and established himself right inside the circles. He was deep. And they got him the ball, and the defender was kind of there. I think it was Wahab was there. So... He took his time, took a dribble, and then hit a little a little half hook bank shot to convert it. That's a transition mm-hmm. basket, but I'll bet the house they didn't count that as fast break points. Sure. Yeah. It's a transition basket. I'm sorry, it is. Um 
I thought Michigan State's transition game was really good. Period. Yeah. No matter what those fast break numbers say, I thought it was really good. And I think uh, much like I thought in general, Jeremy Fears is better pushing the ball. I think, you know, Trey Hallman better pushing the ball too than AJ. Uh, yeah. Both those players yep. do a bit better job. I mean, AJ is fine, but he tends to not push up quite as much as, but I mean, it's still, they were great. And so it's nothing really too much. That's like nitpicking at this point. Um, all right. So good game for Michigan State. Not I mean, interesting of interest there. Malik Hall is now up to 36.4% from three. With that, with his three wow, points I mean, wow. So huh. uh, he is, and he's got to be close. He's, he's got to be closing in on fifty percent in conference play. Probably is. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I yeah, I don't. Have, I just have the season stats. I don't. I don't That's think interesting. That far. That's interesting. Huh. Now, now, not huge volume. Forty-four shots that, for the season, which is you know how many games are we in now? Th- Thirty games or something. It's or about a. It's yet, about but. an attempt and a half, and so. Yeah. In fairness, you would say, well, if he's really going to impact games, if you think about the guys who have been real weapons at that position from three, you know, uh, Kenny Goins late in his senior year. Yeah, yeah. Two, um, three Jaron Jackson, uh, Goran mm-hmm. Sutan, uh, A.J. Granger, on and on and on. They have tended to be higher volume guys than that. Probably, you know, somewhere between two and three attempts per game at least. Yeah. Um, and Malik's not doing that, and I, I tend to think he probably won't. But I don't think so. But I'm okay because right now the brand of basketball he's playing is really, really good, um, and uh, and he's confident. He looks confident shooting it, and for all the talk about, you know, his changed release and, and all of these things, which there's some <laughs> truth to, there is. Yeah. But the results are the results. And if he again, if he keeps this up, I, I beg in part because the volume is low enough, he could hit forty percent by the end oh, of sure. the year. That's still on the table. Yeah, you know. So, yeah, well, his, in, his, interesting stuff. His shot fake is a lot better now at the three point line because now you're yep. like, oh, he might actually. They've got to. They right? got to react to it. Yeah, they got to respect it. And um, if they don't bring a quick double, he's going to, I mean, I think we saw it today. I mean, well, I think no better ex- example of his handle than going coast to coast when he went like 90 feet or something. That was unbelievable. On that, rebounded and drove it between his legs. And yeah. Uh, and what's funny is it almost seems like it's in slow motion. Like he's not. It is in slow motion. You know? it, but he, but it just, no one can stop him. It was, it was very I, impressive. I have said this for the, this is the third year in a row I've said this. He is fully capable. If you think back to the COVID year, which I know is kind of an unpleasant memory for people, but but one <laughs> for a lot of reasons. But one <laughs> one thing that was good about Michigan State that year, especially down the stretch, is if you remember how Aaron Henry was playing, where he just slow and and he had been a guy that people bitched about constantly when he would try to go off the dribble and he'd get stripped. That yep. went on for the first two plus years of his career. And I'm not saying entirely without merit, but mm-hmm. the back half of his last year at MSU, he slowed it down and regularly he would catch the ball at the top of the key or the free throw line and just slowly, steadily work himself via the dribble in traffic into position to score. And MSU went to it over and over and over and it was one of the main reasons they were able to finish the way they did that season by beating all those top 10 teams. Uh, it was the way Aaron Henry was playing. I've maintained for the last two plus years, Malik Hall has all those same elements in his game. He is finally showing them consistently. Now that play you're talking about was not exactly what I was referencing. It was a full court maneuver, but yeah, (laughs) Yeah. he does slow it down and, and it's effective. You know, uh, sometimes it's it's the same in pretty much any sport. It's not really about pure speed. This could be a basketball player. It could be a pitcher in baseball. But yep. To some extent, probably a wide receiver in football or a running back. It's not about pure speed as much as it is how well can you separate from the guy trying to stop you. Or in baseball terms, 
you know, how much, how is your, how is your pitch playing? How does it look to the batter? Not how fast it actually is. And so I think that, you know, this was always Cassius's great strength is Cassius was yes. not a fast guy. Well, boy, he didn't have any problem separating from people, did he? It's because he knew how to use change of speed. In Malik's mm -hmm. case, I think it's, I don't know if it's purely change of speed, but he takes his time and that can be a problem for a defender, you know? Yeah. yeah I think it throws a lot of guys off that someone is, and his, and his, his handle seems to have gotten tighter to me. Yeah. I think his finish is really fast. And I think that's what that throws is, you off. It's yeah. like slow dribble, slow dribble. So yes, it's, you're oof, right. But then it's like, oh, off the back of the floor, you know yep. it. I agree with that. I agree with that. That's yeah. probably, that, I think that's true. Uh, so anyway, Michigan State will be gets up to seven and or now eight and six in yep. the league, uh, and easily in fifth place. Uh, they're only half game back behind Northwestern, who now with the loss of Ty Berry for the rest of the season, unfortunate yep. for them because he's a really good player. Uh, they're probably going to struggle a little bit down the stretch. So you know, Look. you could see getting the double by Big Ten tournament, getting a little extra day rest, and so you don't have to play as many games. And so that should be very helpful. Third is not off the table. Oh, I don't think so. And I'm not getting that. I'm not getting ahead of myself, but just you look at it. I, I looked at Northwestern schedule today without Ty Berry. Look, maybe that maybe they'll respond, but that's a tough situation because they had yeah. virtually no backcourt depth anyway, and and they really rely on their guards to score. You know, it's basically their three guards and Barnheiser. That's their yep. offense. So now you've taken one of those. It would it would be like Michigan State losing Jaden Akins, you know. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal. Um, yeah. I think they could go. They're eight and five right now, right? Or is it eight and six? Eight and six. Eight and six. I will not be surprised if they end up. Oh, no. Uh, Northwest is eight and five. Yeah. Eight Sorry. and five. Yeah, they're eight and five. I would, yeah. I would not be surprised if they end up. 11 and nine or even 10 mm -hmm. and 10. They, yeah. It's not that they're playing ultra, ultra heavyweights, but just there's a fair amount of road games and, yep. and they're road games that are places, you know, like they got to go to Rutgers. Well, do you really want to be going to Rutgers right now? I don't think so. Not with yeah. the way they're playing, you know, it's situations like that. We'll see. But the other team is Wisconsin. Now they managed to, beat Ohio State and end Chris Holtman's Buckeye career. Um, <laughs> it was last night, I think. Um, yeah. But they've been in free fall. I don't, I don't think that Wisconsin is any safe bet. Now, maybe they'll go on a run to close the season, but I don't think – they're only one game ahead of Michigan State. Yeah, right they got now. the tiebreaker, obviously. They do. So, to, so they'd have so to really difference. fade. And I did, unlike Northwestern, I did not look at their schedule. To see what they've got. There's but, theirs is not easy. It's okay. not easy. They they could easily drop a couple. I mean, you know, if Michigan State wins everything and loses at Purdue, I think they there's a reasonable chance they could pass Wisconsin. It's a, yeah. better than zero. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Wisconsin's got five losses already in the league, right? They're nine and five. Mm -hmm. Is it yep. crazy to think that they could end up taking three more? Um, you know, go three and three down the stretch. I don't they'll lose to Purdue so. just like Michigan State. Okay, so yeah. they're at Purdue, so that's one. Mm -hmm. um, do yeah. they play? Who do, who do they play? Do you have it in front of you? I think Illinois is the other one. I'd have to look at the schedule. Oh, but yeah, is, that, is it at Illinois? I think so, yeah. Oh, that's, They've yeah. got a tough schedule. There you go. So you can't rule it out, but I think that definitely uh, Wisconsin's play of late and Northwestern's injury situation definitely opens up a possibility for Michigan State to get into that top four. Yeah. I think that's and I, I think that's true. Um, and I think you know, there's with with the way the Big Ten is in road games. I mean, honestly, if Michigan State just runs off a bunch of them here, they could catch even Illinois. It wouldn't be impossible, right? Because right. Illinois, anything's right. really Illinois got Illinois got four. I think they're nine and four, right? So, yep, Illinois probably a two game edge on the loss column. That's going to be tough to make up. But as you say, not impossible. Kind of depends how they close and. You know, we, it, it remains to be seen, but um, yeah, the opportunities are there. And I guess before we go, I, I did want to touch on, and we'll we'll have a lot more to say certainly once a hiring situation or hiring decision is made. But 
you know, I mentioned a second ago, Ohio State fired Chris Holtman, which is interesting to do it now um, yep. as opposed to letting the seat, letting him have the rest of the season. Clearly, they weren't going anywhere. I mean, it was already over, but if it wasn't over, the loss against Wisconsin last night yeah. was the death now. Uh, and it's a... <laughs> It's really funny. I mean, I got a lot of thoughts on this, but what I'll share is that there's there's certain people in the media for it, and I get it because Chris Holtman seems like a nice guy, but there's certain people in the media that you can tell, Jeff Goodman is who I'm talking about, uh, you can <laughs> tell are enamored of him. Because when I read Jeff Goodman's tweet on the story about him fired, being fired, and I read the spin, and it was spin. Like, well, he had five straight twenty-win seasons, and his uh, his first, what was it? His first four. Um, I can't remember what else he said, but it his was, first season or two were pretty surprising that he did as well as he did. And then it his, was sort of like, his first season was, but you know, he was doing that with Thad Mata's players. He was right. Oh, sure, and. Mm-hmm. And I think that the only other season he had where you could look at it and honestly say, well, he had a good year was the COVID year where, you know, Michigan State, they're one of the teams Michigan State beat down the stretch, but they were, I think they were a two seed that year. If I remember correctly, they were ranked in the top 10 most of the season. Uh, And it was an extremely good Big Ten at the top. So they got some benefit from that. But here's the other thing. When the guy made the NCAA tournament, he never got past the round of 32. He never made it to a second weekend at Ohio State. And then on top, I I guess my point is, it was portrayed as, well, he missed the tournament last year, and it looks like they're going to miss it again, so he got fired. No, no. I've been talking about how Chris Holtman should be on the hot seat for, I think this is the fourth year. (laughs) We always talk about it. Yeah. But he's at Ohio State. That's my point about the spin zone with this that no this guy's been you have to look at what people at ohio state should be looking at and probably are which is we haven't even been close to contending for a big 10 title and in that job over six years i think was his tenure or seven one or the other um that's inexcusable and it wasn't like the program was an absolute train wreck they did a couple of off years at the end of Mata's tenure, but his, Holtman's first year demonstrated it wasn't a lack of talent. They had talent. So he yeah. wasn't inheriting some mess. Um, he just didn't do, he may be a nice guy, but man, he just did not do the job. And I guess I got to give Ohio State credit for acting when they did. Now, the interesting thing is going to be so, you know, inevitably people's minds turned to, well, who are they going to hire? And you're hearing a lot of lists, but what's interesting about them is it's very much a high major or high major adjacent dominated list. And normally I would be very skeptical of that Mm -hmm. for reasons we've talked about many times here. I'm not skeptical in this case. One, because I think there are some, um, there are some connections here that maybe wouldn't be apparent in, every kind of high major job opening up wouldn't be existent. But the other thing is Ohio State actually is a really good job for a certain kind of coach. Here's who it wouldn't suit. I don't think it would suit John Calipari. I don't think it would suit Rick Pitino. Um, What I mean by that is guys who want to be the show. Ohio State basketball, for as good as it's been and can be, will never be the show there. The only difference between that job and Michigan is that it historically receives better administrative support. Um, Mm -hmm. They have more resources. They deploy to it, you know, that type of thing. But it's similar. The, The fan base does not get that excited about basketball. They'll support it if they're good, but it's not a basketball school. For a lot of guys, that's just fine. Yeah. If they can be left alone and and they haven't and yet they have enough resources to win with, they'll take that. You know? Yeah. And and so I look at that list and there's a number of guys I would say 
to me at this incredibly early stage, the two guys that seem to make the most sense, uh, you're hearing Greg McDermott's name, the head coach at Creighton. Now, supposedly, and I haven't, I would have no way of verifying this, but the story seems to be that he does not have a good relationship with his current AD. If that's true, that's the kind of circumstance that can change the usual dynamic, which is high major, and in this case, Big East counts. High major yeah. coaches don't tend to move to another high major job. The exception to that can be if there's a problem with the administration. So if that's true, that might be a reason. You know, the other thing is there were a lot of people that thought McDermott was going to get this job, whatever it was, six years ago, and Holtman got it. He would, In fact, there was a point in that process that, if I remember correctly, he was considered the favorite to land it, and then they ended up hiring Holtman instead from Butler. Um, okay. So he would be interesting. The other name is Sean Miller from Xavier for the second time. And he's having a down <laughs> year, but don't give that any credence because they had some pretty serious injuries to a couple of their big men before the season started or very early on. And it's just absolutely killed them. They were really good last year. And I have to say, I don't think Sean Miller is a hall of famer necessarily, at least not yet. But if you look at his track record, if he took that job, I think he'd be this. He'd have the second best track record of any coach in the Big Ten, because I believe he's been to four Elite Eights, which yeah. trumps Matt Painter, and he's had a lot of regular season success too at Xavier and at Arizona. Um, he can't win Elite Eight games. He's never been to a Final Four, but still, <laughs> you get to four Elite Eights, you're a pretty damn good coach. I think that's serious because one, he's coached in this region he's been at xavier over two stints so he knows the midwest he knows ohio certainly the second is rumors were that his brother archie miller actually wanted the ohio state job and ended up having to take the indiana job because ohio state went a different direction so that might indicate okay. there's you know something in the family so those two guys have been mentioned you're seeing a lot of other names i actually think in the ohio state case it might be credible that you see a high major coach end up in that job. Uh, but one to watch, and it's especially going to be fun if the other two jobs in the league that look like they might open up end up opening up, which would be Indiana and Michigan. Um, we could have a very interesting <laughs> coaching offseason in the Big Ten. May have a splash of reality on certain fan bases and sort of the, the desirability of their programs, right? You're, you're right. And that's why I'm mentioning, that's why I want to talk for a second about Ohio State, because I think, as opposed to some of these other jobs, Michigan, um, they actually will be very <laughs> attractive. Seriously, Michigan will not be attractive un unless there's a weird situation um, where somebody's just desperate to get out. Uh, Jimmy King. They won't be attractive. Well, they won't be. That would be great. <laughs> they won't be attractive to a, a high major coach who's credible because right. they have real problems with NIL. And they have real problems with their admissions department. So you can't really deal with the portal the way most coaches want to. So I think if they, and I, by the way, I don't think they're going to fire Jawan Howard. I saw their AD statement this afternoon. It doesn't read like a guy who's considering making a change to me, but we'll see. That's sometimes it's the statement that as the most, the death knell, they say, I have kiss, <laughs> kiss my death. full backing support. Kiss of death, <laughs> but I, I just think. I was already there where I didn't think it was any better than 50 50 that they do it because that's how they operate and they don't yeah, really right. care that much about basketball. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty convinced they're probably not. Now he might resign, but I don't think they're going to fire him. And it's so well, Indiana, we can hope. Indiana is going to be the interesting one because, you know, there's yeah. this school of thought that Dusty May from Florida Atlantic would take that job. And he's a former Indiana super manager. Went to school there, obviously. Um, he's got to be looking to get out of that job this off season, this cycle, because you don't want to take the risk of trying to rebuild what Florida Atlantic done with a third, a yeah. third season. You know, you want to get out now. Um, will Indiana pull the trigger on Mike Woodson? They should, in my mind. I don't know that they will though. And and then if they do, and for some reason Dusty May, who's also being mentioned with Ohio State. If he doesn't take the Indiana job, where did they end up having to turn? And that's where it'll get really interesting. 
because I honestly, and I can scarcely believe I'm saying this, push comes to shove, I might think the Ohio State job is a little better than Indiana. If if only because there's less heat that comes with it. Meaning, better meaning more yeah. attractive Longer to coaches. Yeah. Yeah. Because the resources are similar and you don't have the crazies. Yeah, I guess if you get more NAL or something from Indiana, but... Well, anyway, we'll see what how that all plays out. Yeah, uh, Michigan State is heads to Ann Arbor next, uh, and so we'll be back in a, very soon as we talk about that. As Michigan State goes for the first sweep over Michigan since 2019, it's been a while. Hi, and, time. Uh, maybe what? Maybe maybe it's a game you don't want to win too big and force uh, Juwan Howard out. You might want to just kind of keep it close. So <laughs> anyway, we'll be back. Uh, please check out our support page if you're interested in giving us a couple of shekels to, as as thanks for the show you can get do one-time gifts via paypal or venmo or a recurring basis on patreon or substack you can find all that at the support page at the final force on the schedule.com slash support as well as getting a hold of our sponsors great sponsors of the show the brothers of just two gutters remember 10 percent off if you mention final four with your estimate the squeegee squad of grand rapids 15 percent off if you mention rebound when you get your estimate from them and nudge printing at nudgeprinting.com. Again, those are all on the support page. Nudge Printing gives you 20% off. You might type in Final Four at the checkout and the coupon code. All right, so until next time, the Final Four is on the schedule. Go green.